Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, this session has uh, three uh, presenters, uh, myself, Amir, Leah from Google, and Chandan is uh, from Oracle, is remotely. Chandel? Chandan, are you there? He will show up, I hope. Um, yes, I'm, we'll I'm here. Hi, Chandan. Um, we are the three XFS stable maintainers, each responsible of uh, a different LTS. I do 5.10, Leah does 5.15, and Chan does takes care of 5.4. Uh, of course, we're here to present XFS stable maintenance as a case study because you all have similar issues. And I was very happy to see that Sasha is here with us today. So we're not talking to, I'm not preaching to the choir. That's <laughs> one good thing. And I wanted to start by showing a, a retrospective of what happened in stable kernels, XFS and stable kernels over the past five years. Uh, this is a plot of uh, number of um, backports per LTS release. It's loosely on the time series. It's not exactly, it's on the release uh, number series, but I try to align them as much as I could. And uh, we can see some drama going on here, right? <laughs> and I'm going to t talk about what happened. Uh, why does this uh, plot look so uh, hectic? Uh, but you can clearly see that uh, five years ago, there was an okay period for uh, maintaining uh, backports of XFS to stable trees. And around uh, year zero, or whatever that is, uh, around the release of 5.10.0, uh, things came to a halt. Uh, so a little bit of history, what, what happened there. Actually, you can also see, if you look closely around year minus um, hundred, you'll see a slowdown in the uh, 4.14 uh, backports, and also uh, a little bit of a shaky start for uh, uh, 4.19. So around that time, there was a little bit of a, a another clash between XFS maintainers and uh, stable tree maintainers. Um, uh, which had the XFS maintainers go, uh, you cannot backport stuff without testing properly, and testing properly is this, and they defined what this means. And then um, Sasha had to do some work in order to accommodate uh, the new defined requirements, and that was uh, the, the period of slowing down. And at the same time, uh, Luis uh, started uh, polishing up uh, KDevOps, and they both had a talk about this at LSFMM uh, 2019. And in the start of the 419 is there when Luis started to uh, run uh, tests on KDevOps and, and post some, uh, post some patches. Uh, but after that, after a while, Sasha got his setup. Um, uh, he had the, uh, finished the learning curve, uh, put the FSS to, uh, to uh, regression testing, and AutoCell was working fine. What happened around uh, the start of 5.10? A uh, combination of a few things. There wasn't any big disputes. There was some in small incident. It's mentioned on NWN. There's a link from my talk on stable backports last year to this small incident. Uh, this small incident actually had to do with linger time for taking patches, and this is an issue that just was just discussed, uh, and even Sasha made some changes about lingering patches longer before they go to stable, but it wasn't the main issue. The main issue is that uh, Sasha just couldn't keep up with maintaining FS tests, maintaining the uh, uh, test infrastructure in a way that is uh, sustainable. It took too much of his time, of his private time to do it. And there was also an employer exchange at that time that contributed, and then there was nobody to do the job. I mean, 
the requirements were set and the high bar was set for what it takes to get patches into uh, XFS patches into stable, but no one was there to do the work. So for two years, XFS in stable was on life support. Um, I should say that none of the users of those distributions, I don't know, that were using 5.10, uh, Ubuntu, uh, um, Microsoft, uh, there are several distributions using 5.10, for the users of those distributions, the title is that they get a stable kernel and they are using XFS and XFS is a well-maintained file system. So how would they know they're, they're getting a non-maintained file system? Nobody told them. Um, anyway, uh, two years later, uh, LSFMM last year, we met up, of course, we discussed this before. Uh, there was work going on behind the scene between me and Luis and uh, Leah. But uh, we set up, uh, of course, with Derek, and we set up a system uh, where we have three maintainers. Each takes care of testing their own kernel, specializing in their own LTS kernel, and starting, uh, starting backporting patches and what hopefully looks like a sustainable uh, process. Uh, we have the uh, yellow line here of Chandan making all of us look bad, but, um, but one thing I want to say, and you don't see this uh, in the plot, uh, the, the red plot at the bottom, uh, it's Leah's work. This is backed up by uh, corporate. <laughs> Google that's contributing resources and of course manpower to a, to a distribution, to Google Cloud OS distribution that they have business needs for this, uh, to make this happen. Same goes for the yellow line, uh, it's backed up by Oracle, um, and driven by business need of uh, um, unbreakable kernel release uh, and puts cloud resources on that while the green line is community resources. <laughs> I started doing that for my employer when they were using 5.10, but right now it's, uh, this is volunteer work and it's community resources contributed by Samsung and the work that Luis is doing, I mean, without getting KDevOps and a machine, I would be able to have goodwill to do this work, but I wouldn't be able to do that. And this is what was happening before we started to do it. I was doing the backports for my employer, but I couldn't do the community work. So there's a lesson learned here. But first of all, we need the companies that do uh, the distributions to support, but also to contribute to community resources um, so we can deal with uh, orphan uh, releases like 5.10 and and also need to take care of this new one. Yeah, so I think uh, a lot of you are probably already aware of the problem. Um, and so a lot of, right now, a lot of the backports are very ad hoc. And so authors will sometimes backport to some branches, all the branches, or sometimes not care. Um, and then also there's the fixes tags that you seeing stable, but again, that's hit or miss. Um, and then there's auto sell, which is going, but even with the automatic backporting, a lot of patches that don't apply often just get dropped because no one follows up with them. Um, and possibly even worse, patches that might apply. Um, patches might apply even if there are critical pre like prerequisites missing. And so that would totally uh, slide under the radar. Um, and yeah, also there's little testing. So what we've been doing, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, just designate one person per tree. And it's just so someone can be more familiar with that specific stable tree and keep an eye on things. Um, and then we're just grouping things into batches, running a set of tests on them, and sending it out to the Linux XFS tests, or Linux, Linux XFS mailing list with the testing results. Everyone can take a look, get some people to sign off on it. And then if no one yells, send it to the stable um, list. Impact, this is already seen by the chart and stuff, but uh, several hundred patches already got backported through this. 
And as we talked a little in the last session on KDevOps, but there's been uh, improvement testings to both KDevOps and GCE XFS tests, which I think are the primary testing used for backporting. And Derek. <laughs> hey, everybody. So obviously, you know, I put this, I got this slide into the presentation, but uh, what management, what Oracle management kind of wanted me to do at LSF for this talk is to tell us, tell everybody a little bit more about what we've been up to with the LTS kernels. Now, you know, it, basically in the old days, we would just kind of take a kernel and branch it off, apply random patches to it as necessary ship and ship it to customers, which is basically, you know, the, the classic Linux distributor model. But we have reworked all of our processes to make it so that uh, the unbreakable kernel is basically hitched up directly onto the LTS trains. So now so nowadays we actually do take just follow the stream of LTS backports and everything that goes into them ends up eventually in a UEK release when we get around to doing that. Now, standard Oracle disclaimer here, I'm not talking about future products, blah, 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 other than in the most vague hand-waving terms. There will be more LT, UT, there will be more UEK kernels at some point, I guess. <laughs> Anyways, so one thing that I that I feel like has been complained about a little bit by the stable maintainers is that there aren't a, a lot of people who will, who are willing to stand up and say, yes, we use the LTS kernels, yes, we build it into our products, yes, we are willing to fund development to do backporting work and whatnot, and you know, upstream work too. So here we are, Oracle Linux uses LTS. We pick up the odd year LTSs for UEK and we are totally willing to fund the part, at least the parts of the stable backporting stuff that we actually have any expertise about at all. I mean, you know, we're not, we're probably not gonna end up backporting like, I don't know, AMD GPU or anything like that. But I mean, at least for the XFS and storage parts, we do take care of some bits and pieces of that. We've actually integrated the uh, LTS process in, or into our own UEK backporting process to the point where it's now actually easier to get things into UEK by simply taking the upstream patches and getting them backported into whatever the target LTS kernel is than it is to go through our whole entire bug filing process and bug trees and yeah. No, but I don't particularly like it, but like doing the old bug process. So it's really nice to be able to just see things slide in like that. Let's see, would you mind advancing to the next slide? So we, we would like to continue to ensure LTS kernels stay current for a while. Now, I've kind of heard some mumblings about shortening the LTS release window I think it's like six years or something like that and slowly decreasing. We would kind of like it to stay, we would like, we'd like it to stay at least a couple of years because frankly, it takes a while for us to get customers actually onto a new UEK. You know, I, I, since I sometimes work with directly with customers, but often don't, I'm not exactly sure how long it takes, but I know that it's more than a few months and probably a year or two would be a reasonable guess, is my best guesstimate on how long it actually takes customers to end up on a new UEK. So hopefully the, the support window for them does not shrink too much. But we also recognize that all of this stuff does take a considerable amount of engineer time and some amount of cloud resources, conveniently we're a cloud vendor, so, you know, we, we got to, we hope to find some kind of balance somewhere in there. Let's see other bits and pieces. So, you know, I, I think, I, I think Ted's been talking about how he's interested in having a stable team to, for EXD4, similar to what we do for XFS. So I, 
so I just want to say that as the upstream XFS maintainer, I am really, really, really grateful to Amir and Leah and Chandan for taking on this task of familiarizing themselves with a particular LTS kernel release and backporting things and running th things through QA. Because as, as it is, I can, I can just about keep up with upstream as it is. And part of that weird plateau in, in the graphs on the first slide was just me not scaling and not keeping up with anything. Anyways, so Oracle is willing to contribute to making various bits of per subsystem where per maintainer stable patches happen. Obviously, these things come with some limits, like we do not want to have random on disk format changes backported into stable. I mean, generally, that's not that hard because the on disk changes are really obviously large chunks of patches. And, you know, we're, internally, we've kind of talked about whether or not it's better to cherry pick backports like like uh, like we're doing right now, or whether it would be better to try to forklift entire releases into old kernels. Of course, the standard answer to that is LOL folios. <laughs> so I don't know that we can, I don't know that we could even really do that. I mean, I think that's just too much stuff to backboard. Anyways, so that is my contribution to today's presentation. Just, just just to address the LOL folios, um, I am totally up for maintaining a folio compatibility layer for old kernels if this is something that people want to do in general. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be just XFS that benefit from this. I mean, if ext4 wants to fork, or if, if somebody wanted to forklift ext4 or butterfs into an old kernel, talk to me and I, I, I will be interested in talking back to you. Actually, it's not just forklifting. We're also going to run into the problem that the changes for Folio are invasive enough that mechanical backporting of patches is also going to be difficult without this layer that you propose. So pretty much AutoCell is going to break as soon as we get enough changes into Folio because a patch that applies on a Folio kernel won't apply on a, uh, a non-Folio kernel. And so we, we need some way of either coping with that or we need a lot more work put into backports. I mean, I can only speak for ButterFS, but uh, chances are if there's a bug, it's going to be somewhere not folio related. And if it's folio related, it's because folios are there and we screwed something up. So I'd, uh, like, I mean, maybe it's more useful for you guys, but I think for us, there's like that nice stark divide, right? We tend to fuck up things that are not related to anything else, just us. <laughs> What I was thinking was an unrelated bug in a piece of code that's already been updated for folios, because now the diff doesn't apply. That was the problem I was thinking we'll have. Yeah, I mean, th that's essentially one of the reasons why I am very, very interested in trying to recruit um, people who might be interested in learning more about ext4 for some sort of ext4 stable backports team. Number one, um, I think it's a really great way of uh, career progression. Um, so if we have junior engineers who today are, you know, fixing spelling mistakes and maybe are trying to address syspot bugs, um, but don't actually have the background to understand why the syspot bug was being triggered or report was being triggered, um, I've actually found that sometimes I'm spending more time with uh, you know, new engineers for whom the first thing the company has assigned them up to do is to fix six syspots reports, teaching them that you know, hammering on it until the until the warning doesn't trigger without actually fixing the underlying bug is actually not useful. Um, and it occurs to me that if there are people who companies that just simply want to get their engineers up to speed on a file system giving them a pathway so that they can contribute in a structured way to the community. And the advantage of doing um, backports is it, someone has already fixed the bug. It's just simply a matter of transplanting the bug fix um, into an older kernel. 
Um, it's a great way for them to get up to speed, uh, and it's a great way of expanding the development community for that file system. Uh, so that's one. And then the other is uh, because of the folio changes, and sometimes it's not even um, you know the folio changes proper. It's people saying, well, while we're making all these changes, let's clean up the function signature so instead of returning a Boolean, we return an error pointer. Um, and the patch applies cleanly, um, but in fact will horrendously malfunction. Um, we had one of these this last merge window where the ext4 tree worked just fine in isolation, the mm tree worked just fine in isolation, but when you merged the two, the result failed. And there was no merge conflict. Um, and we've had another situation in ext4 where a missing prerequisite patch, which you know changed the semantic meaning of a, of a function, but didn't change the function signature, meant that it builds, ship it, isn't gonna catch the problem. We had to revert the patch and then reapply the patch after applying the prerequisite patch uh, in the stable tree. And uh, I think some of this is one of the reasons why the XFS community really decided to go down the stable maintainers um, uh, path and I've started to see that more with ext4, and I've certainly seen problems where I just haven't had time, so a critical bug fix patch didn't apply, and Greg and Sasha very dutifully sent me an email saying, this patch didn't apply, so we dropped it, you know, we tried to backport it and we couldn't, and I just didn't have the bandwidth to backport the patch myself, and it fell on the floor. Um, and if, you know, if it's a critical bug fix or security fix, um, that's not particularly good for those companies that are relying on stable for, you know, keeping up with uh, bug fixes, right? Um, you know, there are, re you know, some customers demand that you remediate high severity CVEs in, in a short window of time. And to the extent that automated backports solve that problem, it's great, but I have a concern that you know, things, the churn rate has gone up so much in file systems, and you know, maybe this is not a new problem because other parts of the file system have had a lot of, you know, API churn, um, but I've noticed that that's becoming more of an issue in the file system space, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm, you know, seriously thinking about trying to recruit for uh, an ext4 stable backports team, much like what has been described here, um, this may not be the best place to actually do the recruiting, um, but if you know of some people who are interested in learning about file systems uh, and are trying to find a way to, you know, take that next step beyond, you know, my first patch, uh, you know, <laughs> have them contact me. Yeah, and another thing with that is um, the, it, it's a very uh, bite-sized way to learn about things because you get sets of patches and you can dig into just those areas at a time. And, and so it's not as overwhelming if you aren't extremely familiar with the area. Um, and also if you are on the latest, one, like 6.1, if you're say on like 5.10 or 5.4, you're kind of following along with the patches that are already going into the ones ahead of you. Um, so it is a very approachable thing to get into. Um, the other things we have left to do is to make it easier to identify potential backports. So this does end up taking a lot of time. I think Shonda mentioned it take, took him some time too. Um, so I'm not quite sure the best route for that. I know besides just manually combing through things, um, I know there are some opinions against adding uh, CC stable or fixes, but adding those things would at least be like a red flag for us to like look at them, like, hey, make sure you don't miss me, even if they aren't automatically pulled in through the uh, automation. Um, the other thing is unifying accepting testing procedures. There was uh, discussions a while back over some emails about um, how many runs to do, how many configs to do, and things like that. And there was very degrees of uh, what people are comfortable with. So it would be very nice to find the minimum amount of testing we need to do that makes everyone happy so we aren't just uh, wasteful with resources. Go ahead. I guess just one idea uh, that might help um, 
even though some patches are not uh, pegged with the CC stable, um, and even though automation is not used now and we have a proper testing requirement for patches, um, AutoSell is still a tool, and I am, I am curious if one of the, the things that might help would be to see if we can get an output, at least from AutoSell, of candidates that could be reviewed by the LTS team. So that, that would just be a tooling exercise, right? Kind of like, hey, can you guys help to provide at least the candidates? It won't mean that you automatically backport them or that you will backport them. It's just like at least information, you know? Is that a possibility? Yeah, I, I'm totally on support of this. <laughs> so this is something that was already asked before, and the KVM and parts of VIX86 already get that. We, we send stuff with a manual cell tag, and we saw that in the past few months the, the actual number reduced mm -hmm. quite drastically because I, I I don't know why maybe those sub, sub, maybe those subsystems became better at tagging things as a result, but that infrastructure already exists. Okay, is is it a, is it possible to reproduce this entire environment so that way one can do and gather the information ourselves? AutoCell is a massive pile of tech debt. It's still running on this old Azure VM. All right, can I can I work with you to try to get that to be Apple. a possibility so that way then no one has to rely on, on you know Sasha yeah. or whatever, but they can go and get this up. Happily, that, yeah. All right. Just saying that you are, we are a bit over time, but so uh, there is one elephant in the room here, which is that Derek put his hand up and said Oracle is assisting with this work because they use the LTS kernels, but we have several other distributions who also have huge backport teams who need to identify all the bugs before they backport them and then actually do the backports who could potentially contribute to this effort as well. And I'm looking at sort of Red Hat and SUSE and Android Ted, because you have a massive backport team in Android for file system stuff, don't you? But, but anyway, uh, is there a way we could actually pool resources across the distributions? I also want to mention that uh, for, from the five years uh, retrospective, uh, a lot more, a lot more, <laughs> Uh, Oracle and SUSE both uh, joined, like, sync to the LTS since those times. So from a minority of uh, distributions that follow the LTS, now, as far as I know, there's only Red Hat. That's not, no. SUSE is on 5.15. I'm not saying they're following LTS per se, but. Like Suse enterprise kernels are currently on 5.14. So so we do backports to 5.14 uh, and we do a lot of them. But so which kind of does a lot of work, what's needed for 5.15 or 5.10, but it's not quite there, yeah? So. <laughs> <laughs> well, so 5.14 is not going to change, obviously. For, for the future, so, we don't have. Yeah, so actually plans are that uh, uh, we do kernel version upgrade every other uh, service spec. Okay. And that means that whatever is released at a time and is stable enough so that it passes uh, mostly mouth long term testing, then we just uh, hook on that and, and then maintain for whatever it takes. So, yeah, uh, but if you hook on LTS, it's a little bit easier. Actually, our trees are available, so uh, whoever wants to start their backporting on, on that, and we heavily rely on git fixes uh, uh, tagging. We have whole infrastructure internally to uh, backport uh, and evaluate most of those. So where can okay. you list the backports? All right, we're calling time, guys. It's, we're four minutes over. Wrap it up. Um, I think the rest of it's been covered, just a summary. Um, Ted already gave a spiel, a pitch for other file systems. Um, benefits, healthier trees. Uh, efficiency, it does require more testing, but by batching things together, you save time. By working simultaneously with the other stable maintainer, maintainers, you save time. Um, so if you are looking for better coverage and better testing and catching more of the bug fixes, it's um, the best way to do it, we found so far. So yeah. Oh.
also, if I can add one last point, as far as making it easier to identify potential backports goes, I think it's generally helpful either to put a fixes tag on the commit itself or push something, push a new test case into FS tests to mark it as a regression since there's all those, all that tagging that Amir added to say that when this test fails, suggest that maybe you should think about backporting XYZ patch. That, that has also been helpful for actually watching those things go by.